Today we're going to go through Lesson 6-2, Properties of Parallelograms, and our objectives today are to use relationships among sides and angles of parallelograms, and to use relationships among diagonals of parallelograms. So let's start by getting a definition of a parallelogram. A parallelogram is a quadrilateral with both pairs of opposite sides parallel. So we have a parallelogram here in blue, and it's a four-sided figure, a quadrilateral, with both pairs of opposite sides being parallel. So we could say that the top and the bottom are parallel, and the left and right sides are parallel. It's the only thing we're saying, that it's a four-sided figure that has both pairs of opposite sides parallel. Nothing about congruent, nothing about supplementary. We'll get to those here in just a second. So now that we have our definition of a parallelogram, let's look at some of the properties that parallelograms have. Let's start with theorem 6.3. It says, if a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, then its opposite sides are congruent. This is really important. We know, our given, is that we have a parallelogram. We're not trying to decide if it is. We know that it is. So the theorem says, if we know that we have a parallelogram, then opposite sides are congruent. So these two sides would be congruent, and the top and bottom would be congruent. So if this side were 13, then its opposite side would also be 13. If the bottom side were 21, then the top would be 21. Both pairs of opposite sides are congruent. A quick example here of how we might use it. Let's say we're asked to find x and y in this problem. Well, if we know that the opposite sides are congruent, then x plus 5 is going to be equal to 12. So x plus 5 equals 12, and we also know that x plus 10 will be equal to y plus 3. And if we're going to try and solve for x and y, let's first get x from this first equation. That's pretty easy to do. We can subtract 5 from both sides, and we get x to be 7. Now, taking x equals 7 and plugging it into the second equation, then we have 7 plus 10, or 17, equals y plus 3. Subtract 3 from both sides, and y equals 14. So there's a real quick example of how we might need to use a little bit of algebra today in some of our homework problems. The next theorem we have is theorem 6-4. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, it starts the same way. We have a parallelogram. We're not guessing. We know we have a parallelogram. Theorem 6-4 says its consecutive angles are supplementary. Well, which ones are consecutive angles? Well, they're angles that are kind of in a row, like 1 and 2 would be consecutive angles. They're next to each other. 2 and 3 would be consecutive angles. 3 and 4 would be consecutive angles. 4 and 1 would be consecutive angles. 1 and 3 are not consecutive. They're opposite. They're on opposite sides of the parallelogram. Same thing with 4 and 2. They're in opposite corners of the parallelogram. And so what this theorem says is that the consecutive angles, like 1 plus 2, they're supplementary. They add to 180. 2 and 3 would add to 180. 3 and 4 would add to 180. And 1 and 4 would also add to 180. And why is that so? Well, if we have two parallel lines cut by a transversal, what kind of angles are 1 and 2? They're same side interior angles. And we know that same side interior angles are supplementary. So we could use the, uh, what we know about same side interior angles to prove theorem 6-4. The next theorem is theorem 6-5. Starts the same way. If a quadrilateral is a parallelogram, again, we're not guessing. We know it's a parallelogram. Then opposite angles are congruent. So if I labeled them the same way I did in the previous theorem, 1, 2, 3, and 4, what theorem 6, 5 says is these opposite angles that are on different sides, they're congruent. So the measure of angle 1 is equal to the measure of angle 3. Or angle 1 is congruent to angle 3. And the same thing with 2 and 4. They're opposite angles. So angle 2 is congruent to angle 4. 
by the theorem. Or the measure of angle two is equal to the measure of angle four. That one's a pretty straightforward one, doesn't cause us a lot of concerns. Just remember that opposite angles are congruent. If we have a parallelogram, we know that. Now, 6-6 six, six is a little bit different. This one deals with the diagonals of a parallelogram. And the diagonals, remember we talked about that in 6-1, is when we join two non-consecutive vertices. So we have a parallelogram, we'll call it A, B, C, D. The diagonals of this are B, D, that's one of the diagonals, and A, C is another one of the diagonals. This theorem says the diagonals bisect each other. So what that means is this point of intersection right here, it cuts BD into two congruent parts. So this segment is equal to this segment. And similarly, this segment and this segment are equal. Now, here's the tricky part. They're not all equal to each other. BD gets cut in half, AC gets cut in half, but we didn't know that the length of BD and the length of AC were the same. In fact, if we distort the parallelogram, we can see that they're not the same length. If they are the same length, we have something else going on, but in most parallelograms, it's not true. So again, we have a quadrilateral, that is a parallelogram, we know that. Then theorem 6.6 six says the diagonals bisect each other, they cut each other, in half, and we'll look at a problem like that here in a second. Let's start with kind of an easy problem here. It says, what is the measure of angle P in the trapezoid, I'm sorry, not trapezoid, in the parallelogram PQRS over here? And what we know is that angle S is 64 degrees. That's the only thing we know. So we have to decide, is angle P a consecutive angle to it, or is it an opposite angle? And if S is right here, P is consecutive. It's not across uh, the parallelogram. Angle Q would be the opposite angle. Angle P is a consecutive angle. So the theorem we knew about consecutive angles said that they add to 180. They're supplementary. So we would need to take 180 minus 64. And when we take 180 minus 64, we end up with C, 116. In this problem, you will use algebra to find the lengths in a parallelogram. Solve a system of linear equations to find the values of x and y in parallelogram k, l, m, n. What are the lengths of segment k, m and segment l, n? So what we're after here is, when we answer the question, what is the length of k, m and what is the length of l, n? That's where we're headed. The diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. So segment KP is congruent to segment MP. And segment LP is congruent to segment NP. Set up a system of linear equations by substituting the algebraic expressions for each segment length. Use the quantity Y plus 10 for the length of segment KP. Use the quantity 2 times x minus 8 for the length of segment MP. <coughs> Substitute the quantity y plus 2 for x in equation 1, then solve for y. Use the distributive property. Then simplify. Isolate the variable to solve. So y equals 14. Substitute 14 for y in equation 2. <coughs> 
then solve for x. <coughs> x equals 16. Use the values of x and y to find the lengths of segments km and ln. Substitute y plus 10 for the length of segment kp. Substitute 14 for y. So the length of segment km is 48. Substitute x for the length of segment LP. Substitute 16 for x. And the length of segment LN is 32. There's one last theorem we need to go through. That's theorem 6-7. This doesn't have to do with parallelograms, um, but it has to do with parallel lines. It says if three or more parallel lines cut off congruent segments on one transversal, they cut off congruent segments on every transversal. So in the diagram here, I have three parallel lines, A, B, and C, and I've marked them as parallel with the arrows. The theorem says that if one of the transversals gets cut into congruent parts, so this segment is congruent to this one, then all transversals get cut into congruent parts. It doesn't mean they're all equal to each other. It means that all transversals get cut. So this transversal over here, it also gets cut into equal parts. If we put a third transversal in, then it gets cut into congruent parts. And if we put a fourth transversal in, it gets cut into congruent parts as well. So 6-7 says that if one transversal gets cut into congruent parts, they all do. In this problem, you will use parallel lines and transversals to determine segment lengths. In the figure, line AE is parallel to line BF, which is parallel to line CG, which is parallel to line DH. Also, the length of segment AB equals the length of segment BC, which equals the length of segment CD, which equals 2. And finally, the length of segment EF equals 2 and 25 hundredths. What is the length of segment EH? You know that line AE is parallel to line BF, which is parallel to line CG, which is parallel to line DH. You also know that the length of segment AB is equal to the length of segment BC which is equal to the length of segment CD, which is 2. Finally, you know that the length of segment EF is 2 and 25 hundredths. What information do you need? You know the length of segment EF. To find the length of segment EH, you need the lengths of segment FG and segment GH. Since parallel lines divide segment AD into equal parts, they also divide segment EH into equal parts. Now use the segment addition postulate. All three segments are equal. Substitute the length of segment EF for the length of each segment. Substitute 2 and 25 hundredths for the length of segment EF. Simplify.
So the total length of segment EH is 6 and 75 hundredths. Okay, so that's lesson 6-2 on properties of parallelograms. Uh, we learned about the sides and the angles of parallelograms and also the diagonals of parallelograms. And remember, the theorems that we have are that the opposite sides of a parallelogram are always congruent. The opposite angles of a parallelogram are always congruent. The diagonals bisect each other and consecutive angles are supplementary. So make sure you get those theorems into your notebooks.